Yes. Thanks for joining us. My name is Dan Hamilton. I uh, direct the Center for Transatlantic Relations at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies down the street on DuPont Circle. Uh, I'm going to uh, moderate our discussion today. Uh, you have everyone's bios, so I'm not going to get into uh, great detail here, simply to welcome uh, Holger Stark, who's the uh, Washington Bureau Chief for Der Spiegel, a German news magazine, uh, Karen Donfried, who's the President of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and Alan Crawford, who's your European government team leader for, uh, for Bloomberg News, uh, who's also written a book on Angela Merkel. Uh, so this is part of the Council series <clears throat> on power politics and trying to get into leadership styles, personalities, people who have power, and to sort of you know, look at that aspect of the issue. And so that we're going to start off with that type of format. We'll have a, a bit of a discussion uh, among us to start us off. Uh, I'm going to ask our uh, colleagues here to say a few words on, on that theme. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a little bit back and forth, and then we'll turn to you uh, for further discussion. Okay, so. Um, so, you know, I think the, um, the issue here is Angela Merkel's leadership style, which has been very successful for her, uh, and high popularity ratings uh, among the German public, uh, strong reputation with her, in her own coalition, uh, huge reputation internationally. And the question really is, does that leadership style uh, work given the accumulating crises that both Germany and Europe are facing now. Some are questioning whether that particular style that she has is attuned to the current uh, set of crises or not. There was a poll just released uh, by a German polling organization, Allensbach, that said that while most Germans, 56%, said they regarded her as a strong chancellor, uh, when it comes to policies, her support of about 50 percent has gone down to about 32 percent. So some in Germany are wondering whether uh, this is the end of the Merkel era, where she'll stabilize and come back. Uh, but the question, I think, of interest to us today is whether that style of leadership, um, the Merkel method, if you will, uh, will get her through these kinds of issues. So we're going to do Germans first, since this is a uh, topic on Germany. So Holger is here, but he's been covering uh, German politics for quite a while and obviously has some insight into that. So Holger, why don't you start us off with that, with that question. Does Merkel's style suit her to these challenges or is she finding some difficulty? Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thank you very much uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations uh, for, for inviting us and uh, putting together this great group here. Um, it's, it's a perfect week uh, for that kind of discussion. Um, uh, Ten years ago, exactly um, to the week, um, Angela Merkel has been uh, been, been elected and uh, being in the chancery, so we have a decade um, right this week uh, to assess. And I've brought uh, two, two uh, cover stories uh, with me uh, to show how differently people look on her. This is uh, The Economist from, from, from like two weeks ago, The Indispensable European. And um, I brought a cover of my, my own magazine, uh, which um, portrays her as uh, Mother Teresa, uh, at least for Germany, probably also for Europe, um, one can say. Um, I think then we really see a watershed moment for her right now. Um, over the last 10 years, she was in trouble from time to time, but uh, her overall pollings were always um, high. She, she really. Um, followed a centrist approach, and, and right now we see for the first time in a decade that she's obviously, at least in Germany, for the moment, governing um, against um, the majority of the Germans um, when it comes to the refugee crisis. Um, you've asked if her style is suited for that kind of crisis. I would put it the other way around. I would say that she changed her style, um, and that makes her struggle right now. For a long time, she always has been um, positioning herself in the middle, in the center. She, she was willing to sacrifice conservative principles, for example, when it came to the, to the nuclear decision um, to, to shift um, to renewable energies after the Fukushima incident in, in, in 2011. Um, but that was backed by almost 70% of the German population. It was unpopular in her own party, but it was backed in, in, by the overwhelming majority of the people. So she always tried to maintain a position in the center of German politics, in the center of, 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 of the polls. And that, that, that was great for her. It was great for the Germans. The Germans believed she was, she was someone who really could be trusted and could lead that country. People 
slept well um, with the knowledge that Angela Merkel would take care of, of, of the things. In September, she, she chose a different path. She made the decision um, to open the, the borders and to let Syrian refugees coming from Hungary in. And since then, um, not only Europe, but uh, particularly German faced this refugee crisis. At the end of the year, we will have a million people coming in, mostly from Syria, but also from other parts of, of Africa and Europe. And that, that brings us to that watershed moment. Um, so the question is, um, not, not if her general style is, is, is good for that kind of crisis, but is her convinced position of saying like, this is not my country if we, we do not have open borders, if the asylum right that we, we've invented after World War II is, is no longer valid, um, this is not my country if we, if, if we are not welcoming refugees. If this, more, more driven by morality and, 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 and not by rational um, aspects, if this approach is, is suiting that crisis right now. Right. Tony, you've been covering uh, her for a long time uh, in various capacities. You wrote a book about her. Can you, can you tell, what, what is the Merkel method? Uh, people talk about this. Is there a certain style that she brings to this? Holger is saying she shifts her style, so maybe there isn't one. Maybe it's a, a stereotype. But uh, how would you describe how she governs? In, uh, in, and again, back to the question, does it suit it to this current phase? Well, she is uh, famously um, a scientist by uh, training, unlike most politicians who tend to be lawyers um, or trade union officials. Um, and in Miracle's case, uh, she is approaching this particular crisis um, in much the same as she, she tackles any other crisis, that she breaks it down into its component parts. And um, she is, for example, uh, under admittedly some pressure at home, um, looking at the domestic aspects of this. Uh, they enacted legislation just uh, recently to try and tighten up the process uh, to make it less generous for refugees to, to arrive in terms of benefits and at the same time to, to facilitate integration of the people who are accepted. But also, and this is the, the interesting fact I find, that. The Chancellor and the Chancellery in general are, are very much reaching out and trying to broaden Germany's foreign policy dimension. Uh, and we see that with um, Merkel. She very controversially went to Turkey just before the, the elections for meetings with the Prime Minister and the President. And she knew that that would be controversial and would be criticised. Uh, equally, she very unusually for Germany came out and said, that we believe that dialogue is necessary with um, the Syrian president, Assad, to, in, to have some kind of resolution. She, of course, um, has been, uh, she met with um, uh, Putin and Obama just in the, in the G20 summit in Turkey, where I just came back from there. And um, Merkel was very much, um, she was very much at ease uh, in terms of this international, global, uh, policy making. And so I would argue that there are various elements, both the ability to, if you like, reverse her position and to sell it to the German public. I'm not saying that she will completely reverse her position, but she can modify it even substantially. Um, but this um, international dimension, I think, is something that is worth watching uh, I, because it could be crucial uh, in the not just the weeks, but the years ahead for Germany and Europe. Well, Karen, you, uh, you've had experience not only working with the organization that focuses on Europe so much, but also uh, you were in the White House and had to see how Chancellor Merkel interacted with the president and uh, with other world leaders. Uh, what do you think, what can you say about her leadership style that you observed and whether it's suited to the current spate of challenges Germany's facing? So when I think about Chancellor Merkel's leadership style, I would describe it as principled pragmatism. I think she does have principles and always has had principles under which she operates, but she also is a pragmatic politician. And when she realizes that she needs to make a course correction, she will do that. And I think when you look at this current spate of crises on which she's shown leadership, if we take the big three, the Euro crisis, Ukraine crisis, and now the refugee crisis, she has shown leadership in all three 
in some more controversial than others. And what's the difference among those three? In my mind, when you think about the Eurozone crises, where she had many course corrections, for most Germans, that was out there. It was about Greece and a bailout for Greece. If you think about the crisis with Russia over Ukraine, again, it was about Ukraine, which was out there. The refugee crisis is about Syrians coming to your town next week and taking over your sport hall so your kids can no longer go there after school. So the way that's affecting Germans in a very direct manner and raising issues of cultural identity makes it quite different from these other crises. And so we now have, to use a Reagan-esque term, seen a scratch in her Teflon. I don't think this is going to be a fundamental challenge to her leadership. As Holger reminded us, this Sunday she'll celebrate 10 years in office. This is a seasoned politician who's dealt with very serious challenges in those 10 years. And let's be honest, what is the alternative to Angela Merkel in her party? We can talk about that, but she is very much the undisputed leader in the CDU, much as we see this backlash in her own party and in its sister party, the CSU, against her. So I would be very cautious about writing Angela Merkel off. This is a challenge. She is committed to her policy. She said, this is my vision. I'm going to fight for it. And when you're a leader, there are important things to fight for. So that would be my suggestion is don't write her off. I think you uh, pick apart these different crises. And you do see that the refugee issue, as Karen said, really reaches deep into German society because they're, they're coming to your hometown. Uh, it's not like a crisis you know, very far away. Um, and uh, you know, Germans I've talked to, they, while they, they greet this a lot, the flu, they rec recognize the refugees are coming because they're fleeing chaos and, and horrible things. What disturbs many of them that I talk to is that they just don't see an end to it. They don't, they don't see a, a, a program. They don't see, you know, here's what we'll do, this is what we'll do. It's basically, we'll just take everyone. And I think for uh, people in local communities and others who are having to deal with the reality of, you know, their schools and their apartments and everything, this, this uncertainty about how this will play out seems to be really what's driving a lot of this nervousness. Holger, I just wondered, do you, th you think uh, she's managing this well in terms of that kind of, uh, you know, uh, unease in German society? Or maybe you don't agree that that's the unease? Um, well, well, let me say first, I, I spoke to her twice in uh, late September and early October um, and uh, for, for background conversations. And she emphasized how important to her uh, this kind of open society is. And I, I, I found that really impressive. Um, it would be easy for her to take another stand and, and to shift it. But she's really convinced, and, and I agree with Karen, that there are principles behind this. So it's not just like looking where the polls go. Um, in this, when it comes down to a small number of really important points, um, she, she just stands to it. She's, she's adjusting a little bit right now because she sees it that her party is not following her, but she's con she, she, she really tries to convince the Germans. And that's, that's a challenge for her because she's not a great speaker. Um, her strength doesn't come like, like Obama's uh, uh, and visionary speech at the Siegessäule in, in 07, 08 in Berlin. It doesn't come out of words or public appearances. She's not great on TV. She, she's great by content and, and by be, being convinced. And she really needs to convince the German people right now to, to, uh, to deal with that crisis. And Karen said it totally right. It's, it's the parents who see that her 17-year-old son can't finish high school in sports because the gym is taken by Syrian refugees. Nothing against Syrian refugees, my son, but my son is closer than, than Syria is. Um, and she really needs to reach out to, those, uh, to, to, to the German population right now. Um, le let me add one point to the pragmatism, which is, I think, the second really important point. Um, she learned that in the GDR, in a totalitarian system, that you just need to be pragmatic, that you need to look for the, on, on the long run, not try to accomplish something on, on, the, on the short run, but you, you, you need to wait and you need to see where the whole system is going and, and take the long-standing approach. And that helps her very much when it comes to a crisis like, like the Ukraine crisis. Vladimir Putin when they first met, um, brought a dog with him because he knew that Angela Merkel is extremely afraid of dogs. So he brought a dog 
in, into that room to test her, to see how, how she would react. And of course she was frightened, but she, she could handle it. <coughs> she, 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 never, um, she never hesitated to keep on talking with Putin or to, to play it the other way around. And in the Ukrainian crisis, Merkel is probably the most important channel towards Russia. Um, and and she's, she's playing the bridge between the US um, and Russia because she developed this ability to look for the long run, to accept that things are sometimes terrible, but nevertheless, you have to deal with it. And she needs to sacrifice her own personality um, and, and, and to keep on going. And I think that's, that's a, the great advantage when it comes to those fundamental crises, like Karen mentioned, the EU crisis, Ukraine, and also the ref refugee crisis. You know, in the German system, there's the chancellor, <clears throat> then there's the president. President's more symbolic, uh, head of uh, state. Um, but it's interesting right now that there is also an East German president of Germany. So both the chancellor and the president are from Eastern Germany. Both come sort of out of the church backgrounds in different ways. Um, do you think, and, that, and, and the president, Mr. Gauck, has all, was just here uh, also, and I think has also uh, conveyed a certain moral authority, a certain, he speaks to uh, the German people in a way that I think has resonated a lot. Um, do you th what's their role with each other? How do, they, how do they interact? Do you think they help each other uh, define their roles? Is there any tension between them? Well, he doesn't have the power, but he also is a man of words, actually, in some ways. Well, one, one <coughs> must know that uh, Gauck wanted to become a Bundespräsident, um, and Merkel picked Christian Wolf um, from, from Hanover in the first place. So in the first place, she didn't allow him to, to, to become president. But again, pragmatism. Um, after Wolf struggled about uh, corruption fair and also this famous sentence that, that um, the Islam is part of Germany, so he, 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 uh, a series of incidents brought, brought him out of, of office. She pragmatically shifted and saw that Gauck maybe would be the right person because he, he in opposition to her, is, is a great speaker. He, he finds the right, word for, right words for, for those situations. Um, so I think she's strong enough to, to accept a strong personality um, beside her. Um, it's interesting that Gauck, in a way, is, um, is missing those opportunities right now because we would need someone who is really addressing those issues to, to the German population. He's, he's not doing that very well right now. So it's clear she's, she's in the driver's seats and uh, there is no discussion about that. No. Uh, you know, the other question I think about her leadership right now in Europe is the, not only within Germany that there are no challengers, but there don't seem to be other leaders in Europe. Uh, as part of it is because other countries are struggling. The British are having their own debates. The French, uh, Mr. Hollande, now is really focused, but <coughs> France has been struggling as well. Italy uh, having tr troubles. Tony, you've been watching Angela Merkel. Now you're looking at the European uh, uh, template. Is this part of the, the fact, or the reason why she has such influence? Is that they're simply everyone else is sort of dealing with their own problems, or is, Absolutely. is there something she, else to it? She she <coughs> seems to be the only um, leader in Europe who is looking at a Europe-wide uh, solution to these particular crises that uh, are, are piling one upon the other, um, and also um, to go back to a point that Holger made, that it's a good one about the president. She. She picked the wrong man, essentially, and uh, he had to resign as president. And then she reversed her position and backed Gauck and took no hit in the polls. Um, for that, you would, it would seemingly be a, a disastrous decision, but it didn't affect her. And we, we should remember that the chancellor has gone against public opinion in Germany before. Um, it was hugely unpopular, her decisions uh, at the beginning of the Euro crisis when it spread from Greece and uh, Germany and others agreed that they would implement this, uh, I think it was about a, a, a trillion dollar financial backstop to try and stop the spread of this debt crisis uh, to Europe. That, of course, came with a substantial amount of German guarantees, financial guarantees, which were hugely unpopular. And her popularity went lower than it is now. And then again, during the, the, the nuclear debate, she was very unpopular. Um, but on this issue, what I find fascinating is that um, from her Eastern heritage, the, the Chancellor has, has been clear that 
she, uh, the, the, the images of these refugees coming in, piling up against the Hungarian border, reminded her of 1989. Uh, and when people were fleeing through uh, to the West, um, obviously a different scenario, but similar images. And she's been very clear from conviction that she doesn't want to build walls in Europe again. Um, and that's her red line, if you like. So I don't think she'll reverse that position uh, in any way credibly. Yeah, Karen, let me ask you anything you'd like to say, but since given the US perspective, so the president has uh, now been dealing with the chancellor uh, very, very intensely for many years now, and seems to have sort of a trust to sort of, some would say delegate <laughs> issues to her, uh, that uh, the US doesn't always have to be running the show and a lot of things. Uh, you see in the Ukraine crisis, basically, you know, she seems to be leading much of those issues and resolving it. Um, on the Euro crisis, there were differences between the US and German governments on the appropriate uh, way to deal with economic austerity or growth, but uh, it, it didn't become a, you know, a, a contentious thing uh, and they got out of hand. So can you tell us a little bit about the two styles? Uh, and how they interact, and you know, is that should should we rely on a personality uh, to uh, to also advance U.S. interests? Personalities matter because when you're talking about the relationships between leaders, it does get to personality and the trust that you build up in that relationship. And when I had the privilege of seeing that relationship between President Obama and Chancellor Merkel up close, they had had four years of working together already under their respective belts. And it was a very deep relationship at that time. And I think a great example of how effectively and closely they've worked together is Ukraine. I mean, those of us who sit in Washington are familiar with the newspaper articles that say Barack Obama has outsourced his Ukraine policy to Chancellor Merkel. In fact, I think it's been the result of a quite effective partnership where both felt how critical it was to have transatlantic solidarity in standing up to this very serious challenge from Russia on the European continent. And that informed the policy of complementary sanctions that we've seen over the past year and a half. On the broader question of leadership, and in some ways this connects the two as well, I was thinking as, um, as Holger and Alan were speaking, you know, what do we think of when we think of leadership? I mean, there's one aspect of leadership which means it can often be quite lonely to lead. And the point that Angela Merkel in many ways is an outsider. We talked about her being from the East. Clearly she's a woman, the first time Germany's been led by a woman. She is a Protestant in an overwhelmingly Catholic party. She is a hard scientist. There are all of these things that make her different. In many ways that's true of Barack Obama too. That may be one thing that unites them. But it also means, I believe, that when she's under pressure like this, and you see so many headlines about Merkel alone, the lonely leader, she is in many ways well equipped to deal with that if you look at her life story. Then what's the second point about leadership? You have to take the costs of being a leader. And when we think about the Eurozone crisis, Germany has paid the largest bill for that. When we think about Ukraine and German <coughs> business ties to Russia and sanctions, Germany's paid a price for that policy. And when we look at the refugee crisis, <coughs> Germany has stood up and said, we are taking, not the largest number, I mean, per capita, we have to give Sweden its due for that, but Germany is taking a large burden on in managing that crisis. And that's part of leadership. You'll be criticized, but she's also setting an example. Now, a third part of leadership, she's gotten so much flack for standing up and saying, wir schaffen das, we will manage this. What leader yes, stands can, up words. and says, we cannot manage this? I mean, would we feel better if she'd stood up and said, we can't manage this? That's leadership. Of course, Germany can manage this, whether it's 850,000 refugees this year or a million. 1% or roughly more of Germany's population, Germany can manage this. And yes, the influx, the speed of that influx is overwhelming at the moment. And here we get to the pragmatism. So what's the course correction? How do you try to slow down that influx to give Germany time to actually put in place measures that convince the German population and the broader European public that in fact Germany and the EU can manage it. So that's why we see her flying to Turkey and trying to manage that deal and think about how do you reinforce the EU's external borders. But 
a leader should stand up and say, we're facing a challenge, but we can manage it, especially when she's the indispensable leader in a much larger European context. Um, indispensable. Uh, the question is whether that's sufficient uh, to lead Europe right now, given so many other uh, challenges. I, I, so I, I wonder, can she do it on her own? Is that too much to ask of Germany? You see, during the Euro crisis, she was, you know, everyone would go to Berlin and ask her for help, but she's also being, uh, you know, uh, depicted with uh, little mustaches and, you know, sort of the very anti-German, anti-Merkel uh, cartoon images as well. And I, I think many in Europe are sort of torn, you know, the fact that they're dealing now with a Germany that has great weight and led by a chancellor who seems to have a lot of influence. Um, Sonia, I just wonder, what do you think about this, um, um, this kind of new dynamic with Germany? Uh, can Germany really step up like that? Uh, is, is, do people really want Germany to play this role, or are they a little nervous? Well, um, <coughs> yes, of course people are nervous. It's hugely controversial. Um, I think that um, on Karen's point in terms of leadership, then um, an interesting point to note is that Merkel has the support of German industry, uh, both on Russian sanctions, which you wouldn't have imagined that uh, the industry of the country would come round and support <coughs> of you, uh, and on the refugee crisis. And that is, that's important. Um, as for Germany's glowing, uh, growing uh, global role, um, that again is something that I, I suspect the the German public at large is uh, will find harder to digest. Um, in the Euro crisis, it was really it was by necessity and by default that Germany is the largest economy. Therefore, it paid the largest bill, uh, and with that came the largest um, amount of power. Uh, in terms of um, foreign policy, no, she cannot do it alone. That's why she's been so um, so determined to try and um, get the Turkish government on board, unpalatable as that may be. Um, she obviously cannot resolve the war in Syria, which is the root cause of all of this. Um, she needs the support of, of, of Barack Obama and um, Vladimir Putin. Um, so that's what I was trying to get at earlier, that that is, it's, it's by no means a given that that will succeed, but I do feel that Germany, to some extent, is, is reasserting itself in, in a peaceful way uh, and taking its rightful place, if you like, as the biggest country in Europe uh, and its global role. We're seeing signs of that, at least. Well, let me, uh, I'm going to come to you, Fulger, but let me, let me push on that a little bit. Global role. You know, critics would say, really? Uh, what's Germany's global role? Everything we've been talking about is Germany's regional role and uh, limited to Europe, which is pretty overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, many would say, what's Germany doing to solve the uh, Syrian issue at its root, not the consequences of it? You're never going to stop the flow unless you deal with the, the issue at hand. Yeah. Uh, you know, and so what, what are we really talking about? And some, I, I wonder, some, some of these reflexes we're talking about, are these reflexes of the old German foreign policy uh, that continues, how much of it is her influence? Checkbook diplomacy, a familiar German way yeah. of getting out of crises. Uh, don't never get out in front, you know, always do it with others. Don't, you know, don't get way out, don't do it alone. Um, how much of that is just sort of the basic German foreign policy establishment reflexes from, from decades now of having to manage themselves, and how much is she changing that, if at all? And, and what, is, what do you mean global uh, policy? You know, aren't we giving the Germans a pass here a little bit, actually, uh, being a little too nice? Shouldn't we demand a bit more of this weighty country? Well, uh, from a German <coughs> perspective, I would say uh, we did a lot in the last, or Germany did a lot in the last years. So a journalist should always maintain a critical uh, distance uh, to, to the subject that uh, he or she is uh, describing. But, um, I mean, I... I <coughs> I, th I think you can't overstate what, what Merkel changed also in the foreign policy in the last 10 years. I mean, the, the term leadership from behind uh, described German, German foreign policy over decades. Germany was always reluctant. Remember Helmut Kohl in the first Gulf War in, in, in 91? He did exactly what you say, it's checkbook diplomacy. He, he wrote a, a, a big paycheck, and, 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 and th that was it. Um, it 
in the Syrian crisis, Germany for the first time delivered weapons to the Kurdish, um, the Kurdish Peshmerga um, a year and a half ago. That was a huge step for Germany, which never would, would, would imagine to intervene militarily in, in such a conflict. Um, so I think also when you look on the Euro uh, uh, Iranian nuclear program and Germany's role in the P5 plus one um, negotiations, Germany slowly shifted away from that uh, leadership from behind approach under Merkel's tenor in the last decade, of course, with the European crisis, um, uh, the Euro crisis in, in the center, but also in other foreign policy um, fields as, as I described. And I think we're somewhere in the middle in that process. Um, for, uh, there are many people in Germany who say that's, that's too fast. Um, um, we, on the other side, have <laughs> Bundespräsident Gauck, who mentioned in his speech at the Munich Security Conference a year and a half ago that Germany must do more. The same did the, the Defense Minister von der Leyen. So I think we're in the middle of a transition period under Angela Merkel's leadership, um, which probably wouldn't be possible if she would speak up loud, as Gerhard Schröder did as, as her predecessor. She's, she's doing it slowly. Uh, with, a, with a modest tone, she's not claiming Germany's new role in the world, but she's, she's basically directing in that direction. Karen, are we giving the Germans a pass? Shouldn't we expect more from them? <clears throat> There's always that question, is the glass half full or glass half empty? And I'm neither a journalist nor a German, but I would see the glass as half full in the case of Merkel. And just to pick up on Holger's last point, in many ways, Merkel has the right personality to do it because there's this unassuming character that she brings to this. And I think it's actually been very helpful to her in a German domestic context, as well as more broadly. And clearly the role we see Germany grasping most robustly is the regional European role, but I think we would be remiss not to see Germany's interests beyond Europe. And just to take one example that we haven't talked about, it's Germany's relationship with China. As Germany looks for growth, it is looking to China. And when you look at how that relationship has changed over the past 10 years, it's quite striking. And I'm actually trying to get someone at GMF to do a study to look at whether Europe has pivoted more to China than the US has, <laughs> in fact. And when you look at, for example, European Union exports to China, Germany leads those overwhelmingly with roughly 44% of those exports. And you drop then to the UK and France at eight and 10%. So China, for example, is very important for Germany's economic health and growth today. And that's just one example. So I do think it is right to reflect on how Germany's role beyond Europe is developing as well. Okay, so we're gonna open it up now. So we have a microphone. Please wait till you get it. And uh, if you can say who you are, your affiliation name, just so our audience uh, and, uh, at home also knows about that. Uh, and if you can be concise, that will help us have more questions. So <laughs> please. <coughs> Yes, thank you. Amy Bondurant. Yesterday we heard Secretary Clinton give an important address on national security building on President Obama's uh, response to ISIS, and Republican candidates have been speaking about this. What do you, role do you envision for Germany and for Merkel in, in terms of the ISIS response? Do you have any other points on that related? Uh, okay, why don't we, who would like to? Well, I mean, that gets back to the question about uh, is essentially is Germany going to back up its, um, its ambitions with, um, with defence capabilities? And I think the answer is probably no at the moment. So I, I think that we've seen, um, uh, we've seen steps forward in terms of the kind of diplomacy that Holger mentioned, which is not unimportant in terms of the Iran deal which probably wasn't really reported here, but Germany was part of the dynamic there. Um, and certainly in the Foreign Minister Steinmeier, is, um, is, uh, he's, he would like to use that as a template elsewhere. Um, in terms of getting people all on board, don't forget that we had um, uh, these talks, successful talks, surprisingly successful talks in Vienna uh, last Saturday at which the Germans were, were involved on Syria. Um, but essentially, to be brief, I don't think we're going to see Germany bombing in Syria anytime soon. <laughs> I'm happy to come in on this as well. First, I just want to make sure we all understand a point that Holger made, which was about Germany sending weapons to the Peshmerga. 
I mean, for most Americans, it's like, whoop de doo Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Why is that significant? Because it was overturning decades of German policy. German policy has been that it will not send weapons into a conflict zone. So I nearly fell off my chair last summer when I heard that the German government made a decision to send lethal assistance to the Peshmerga. And it's interesting when you hear someone like the defense minister talk about that decision. You know, they were very critical of the debate in this country about arming the Ukrainians. So then why were they supportive of arming the Peshmerga? Because the German assessment was that there is not a diplomatic solution to that conflict. And so that's why they were willing to do it. But I think it's highly significant. And it'll be interesting to see if other similarly surprising decisions come in the wake of that. So one point. And the second point is, what are the mechanisms that we could imagine being used for Germany to play a greater role? And we've talked about the fact that you're not going to see German unilateralism on use of military force. So then you think about an EU context or a NATO context. OK, we had President Hollande decide to invoke this article in the EU treaty, sort of the solidarity clause. And everyone's asking, what does that mean? And I love the fact that it's Article 42.7, because <laughs> it says so much about EU treaties. But that's a side point. <laughs> so you, know, you invoke this article, and you're looking for solidarity. Does that mean that the EU is now all going to join a bombing campaign against Syria? No. Does it mean that there could be deeper intelligence cooperation among EU member states? I don't know. That raises hugely sensitive issues around data privacy and civil liberties. But that would be arguably a very smart thing to do in the wake of the attacks that we saw in Paris exactly a week ago. It also could be the way that the French get more help from their European Union partners in areas outside of Europe, like the missions in North Africa, like Mali. And that is interesting to me. Will we see Germany giving greater support to France in some of these other areas to free up French capabilities to combat the Islamic State in Syria. I would watch that space, and that necessarily brings you to the NATO question. I mean, obviously, President Hollande did not decide to invoke Article 5. And there's been an interesting conversation in this city about whether that would be a good or a bad thing. And people who argue it's a good thing say, well, it would show solidarity of NATO allies in the wake of these tragic attacks in Paris. Others say, well, maybe it's not such a good thing. Because those NATO member states that want to be contributing to the anti-ISIS coalition in terms of bombing in Syria are doing so already. And maybe if Holland had asked Article 5 to have been invoked, it would have shown that there wasn't a lot much else that NATO as NATO was willing to do. So I think these are really interesting conversations that are hugely relevant for the debate in Germany, because Germany will only step up that involvement in a multilateral context. You know, just on that, the, uh, today there was the Commission, the European Commission proposed an EU intelligence agency. And the first voice saying not going to happen was the German interior minister, <laughs> who said, you know, this has to remain a national issue. Uh, and you know, on the, I just came back from NATO yesterday, and I think the issue there, what was interesting, the French didn't ask for Article 5, but they also didn't ask for Article 4 mm -hmm. of NATO, which is simply to have consultations on this kind of crisis. And uh, if you think it to 9-11, uh, you know, the United States was also reluctant to have an Article 5 uh, declaration, but the European allies were the ones who called for it. And, uh, and uh, in this time, no one's calling for this Article 4 consultation. Mm -hmm. Even Germany, France's closest ally, you could argue, didn't argue. No one really kind of pushed that, that stream, including the United States. So I think there are some issues here about uh, degrees of solidarity and whether we think our, the instruments we have are, are relevant to uh, the challenges we're facing. OK. Yes, Alan. Please wait for the microphone. <coughs> uh, Alan went. Uh, formerly with the Department of State. Uh, my question involves the Euro. Uh, Chancellor Merkel seemed determined to prevent Greece from abandoning the Euro when arguably Greece would have been better off if it had its own currency, it could devalue, uh, stave off uh, the flow of imports and whatnot. Was her motivation primarily political, or was it rather economic? Greece with the Euro remains a captive market for German exports. Any related questions on the euro crisis, anything like that? Okay. Is, uh, anybody like to tackle that one? 
I mean, I, I feel it, um, the economic um, component wasn't about German exports. I don't think that they add up to much to Greece. Um, it's a um, very small part of the, the European Union as a whole. I, I, in the whole um, crisis over, the, over Greece, um, Merkel again went against public opinion in Germany. Most recently, um, the first half of this year, when the German public would have been extremely happy to, to see Greece leave, I think it's fair to say, um, because they, they felt essentially that um, there was a very abrasive government which um, was doing everything it could to um, undermine Germany and try and form an alliance against Germany. Um, and in this instance, there was a, an interesting split between um, uh, Merkel and our finance minister, Wolfgang Schäuble, where he proposed this plan for Greece to do exactly that, to have time out from the euro. And um, um, the rest of, of, I was going to say the rest of Europe, but certainly the big countries, uh, France, Italy, uh, were against this proposal. Um, but Merkel essentially held the line to keep them in and the reason is, is, is political because the government didn't want to leave. It, it, there, there were voices within the Greek government who, yes, wanted to leave, but the official policy was to stay in. Um, but I think it was, it was fundamentally because uh, financially no one could predict what would happen if Greece left the euro because the idea would be that then the bond yields of all the other peripheral countries in Portugal, in um, Ireland, and then in bigger countries, Spain, perhaps Italy, even France, would blow through the roof um, and other countries would get into serious difficulty and that would hit Germany. Yeah, Mer Merkel was deeply convinced that um, uh, an exit of Greece from the euro could lead to a destruction of the uh, European Union at the end, or at least partly to that. Mm -hmm. And w when we have this one overwhelming lesson from World War II, that, that is that a unified Europe is the guarantee for a peaceful solution. And, and that's especially something that the German conservatives uh, deeply, uh, deeply had into their DNA, at least in the last decades. Helmut Kohl was, was the chancellor who, who basically cleared the road for European uh, unification, and Merkel is on the same path. So for her, it was the overwhelming um, goal to, to keep the European Union together at, at almost all costs. Yes. Hi, I'm Stefan Grobe with uh, Euronews European Television. Um, Angela Merkel is the... Could you stand up to so I think yeah. we need that for our cameras. OK, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Angela Merkel is the, the president of uh, a conservative party. Uh, that puts her, in theory, in the same camp with people like Ben Carson, Ted Cruz, <laughs> Donald Trump, um, et cetera. Um, what do you think? How, how do you see US-German relations evolving after January 2017? And who would be Angela Merkel's most favorite candidate, uh, who would she want to be the next president? Do you have any related questions on the... <laughs> okay. Karen, like... Karen may read this to you. <laughs> I think that Angela Merkel is a Democrat, and she believes in the democratic process, and she will work with whomever is elected next U.S. president, and she will do it from the same principled pragmatism that reflects every other policy choice she makes. I think the interaction is really interesting. And just to pick up on the point about Angela Merkel and her finance minister having had slightly different views during the third bailout for Greece, well, maybe during the first and second as well, you know, the fact of the matter is we all remember Angela Merkel saying there cannot be a bailout of Greece. And now we're on the third bailout of Greece. So again, course correction, she brought her public along. Yes. Actually, she was very popular throughout. If we look at her opinion ratings in April, she was at 75% this year. But it's interesting, this interaction with the finance mm -hmm. minister Schäuble. So Wolfgang Schäuble is the other dominant figure in her party. And on the one hand, some of the criticism in the Eurozone and during the refugee crisis 
has been Troipa taking jabs at Merkel, but it also has been very useful for her because it shows that there is a difference of opinion within her party. And he's been able to voice those views and therefore voters know she's taking them on board, but then she makes a different decision. And I see that same interaction happening in the Eurozone crisis, uh, in the refugee crisis that we saw in the Eurozone crisis. So it's interesting, you can see how she works quite effectively with people from different walks of life, and she may have that opportunity with the next US president as well. And, and again, the pragmatic approach, I think she would adjust just to, to anybody who would be in the White House, although it would be a fascinating uh, experience to, to see her dealing with Donald Trump. Uh, and not only for Angela instance. Merkel would that be a fascinating experience. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, so I, I think she would, she she would uh, probably deal with him like she, she deals with Putin or so. But, but <laughs> let, 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 me, let, me, let me add one, one question. Um, the real interesting- This is on the record, just to- <laughs> <laughs> Really interesting would be to see how she would uh, get along with uh, Hillary Clinton. Two strong women, uh, two women as potentially the most important leaders of the world, or, or the, uh, at least uh, under the most important leaders of the world. Um, I think that would be an interesting test because uh, she's not experienced to deal with, with a strong woman, at least not on the head, head of state's level. Although she has dealt with uh, Secretary Clinton uh, over the years in, in their different roles as well. Yes. Thank you, Sonia Schott with the Ariola Las Americas. I would like to know uh, how to explain since uh, Germany has been always the driving force of the European Union regarding this um, refugees crisis, why Germany seems to be the leader in this regard instead of going with all the European Union countries together and try to give a response to the, the immigration crisis or the refugee crisis? Why seems to be German alone? without the, the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you. Any other questions related to the refugee crisis here? Hope. Hi, Hope Harrison, George Washington University. Um, I just want to commend the council for doing more things on Germany. I think it's great. I've been waiting a few years and it's finally happening and I think that's one indication of the growing importance of Germany. So um, I hope these will continue. Um, you talked about um, Merkel making the decision in September to, you know, be more open to the refugees. And I found that a really fascinating moment because before that, what was at least dominating the headlines here was, you know, sort of violent opposition to those refugees um, in Germany. And I, I felt at the time very much that Angela Merkel um, perhaps was po um, partly thinking of German history and you know the view of Germany and wanting to show a very different face, you know, remembering the Nazi past and um, really stepped in there to say, you know, these um, people on the fringes who are so violently opposed, you know, they do not represent the majority and they don't represent me. And so I'm wondering if any of you know any of the specifics of how she decided to um, open the borders more. Okay, so uh, back to the refugee crisis. Is Germany doing this on its own? Is it leading? Uh, how does her own view figure into this? Well, um, there are various elements here that um, this, uh, it shouldn't have come as a surprise that, uh, that um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees would, would, would come to Europe because um, they've been tracked coming for several years, predominantly as a result of the Syrian war, which is four and a half years on. on. And um, refugees were predominantly coming across the, the centre of the, the Mediterranean, which was a, a hugely hazardous route. And if you remember earlier this year, there were a number of tragedies, but there were hundreds of people killed when one ship went down. And what uh, the the border agencies, Frontex, noted is that there's been a shift of um, people going across the less hazardous route through Greece. <coughs> um, and so with this shift in pattern, then as well as uh, with developments with the Islamic State, then you had two different dynamics that were pushing people up. 
And in fact, the, the European Union summit, uh, the, the leaders had addressed the issue of refugees crisis on two separate occasions this year. So it wasn't a huge surprise to Merkel. Um, this had been building. Now, as we know, she takes her time to, to formulate a response to any particular um, crisis. And then it was interesting to me that she went away on holiday, her summer vacation, and came back. And the first thing she did was she visited a refugee centre. And that was the first indication, the public indication we had, that this was uh, after Greece had died down a little bit, this was on her radar. Then we do know, in terms of a fixed point, that her language was for a, 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 the leader of a country was incredibly strong, that she visited this refugee centre on the, in eastern Germany, on the other side of the street, people were yelling abuse at her, calling her a traitor. And, and the chancellor came out after visiting this refugee centre, and she said that, I, I can have nothing to do with this kind of view, that, that there must be zero tolerance for attacks on refugees. And we know that she was deeply affected there. But that was one concrete moment we know of. We know it had been bubbling for a long time. In answer to your question, why is Germany alone, Merkel has been pleading for months for the other European countries to come on board and help with a, a, a specific system of redistributing refugees. And for various reasons, uh, in the, it, it's, it's political dynamite as it is in the States. They can, it can, France, for example, they cannot do it because of the, the rise of the, the, the National Front. Uh, in the UK, it's also politically toxic. Uh, all of Eastern Europe has more or less refused um, for various political reasons. And, so and, Germany's and, more or less on its own. And don't forget one very important point. Um, Germany is different from the US. Um, in, in the German constitution, we have the right for people to seek asylum if they are under political oppression somewhere somewhere else. That's one of the lessons um, of, of, of the Nazi time in World War II, because Germans had to flee their own country and, and to find and, and, and to look for, for asylum somewhere in the world. So in the German constitution, it's guaranteed for people who, who, who are under political um, oppression that, that they can come to this country and uh, get, get asylum. And I mean, the situation in Syria is in many ways comparable to um, how, they tr how, how the Islamic State uh, treats people as, as the Nazis did in, in, in the 30s and 40s in Germany. So there's a deep, convinced view of Merkel that in, in times of such a crisis, people deserve to, to get shelter and to get a, get, get a protected place where they can be. And of course, Germany is, is the, by economical terms, the most powerful country in Europe. Um, uh, so she is convinced um, that Germany, as Karen said, that Germany can take several hundreds of thousands of refugees. And this Dublin Treaty, just, just one last sentence, the Dublin Treaty, um, which says that refugees have to stay where they first hit the European Union. It's, it's in many ways a lie because it, it puts a lot of pressure on Italy, on Greece, um, on, the, on the Balkan states. So on the, on, on the outer, outer um, uh, uh, rim of, of the European Union, Germany is somewhere inside. And as Merkel saw how unwilling Eastern, the Eastern European countries were to treat those, those um, uh, refugees, she, in a pretty spontaneous moment, in a pretty, pretty emotional moment and said, oh, yeah, we, sh we are schaffen das, we, we are able to do that, and those people are allowed to come. I just want to footstop this, this point about the power of the past in all of this. I mean, when Merkel was elected 10 years ago, there was a question about how committed she would be to European integration. And what we saw during the Eurozone crisis is one of the principles she was defending was that she was not going to be the chancellor of Germany and see Greece leave the Eurozone. Because it, the butterfly theory, it's a little butterfly, 2% of the Eurozone economy, but you don't know what the implications of that are. And if there's a chance, that could lead to the Euro disappearing and the European Union being fatally wounded. That was not what she wanted to preside over. So this commitment to European integration is there and this understanding of German history. So when, you know, as Alan said, it's not a surprise, actually. Maybe the numbers were not anticipated fully, but we remember the March European Council meeting of earlier this year when Renzi allegedly said, if this is solidarity in Europe, I don't want it. 
This had been a front burner issue for much of this year. So it didn't catch her by surprise in that sense. But I think when she looked at what was happening and calculated, we can't stop these refugees from coming, but we as Germany also cannot send them back because German history is singular. So I somehow do have to be the welcome culture. We've got to figure out how to manage that, and that's proving more of a challenge than perhaps was anticipated. But that's what I meant by this principal pragmatism, that she does have a view of the role Germany needs to play, and that is what is informing some of these really quite hard decisions that she's making. Yes, right here. Please. Thank you very much. I'm Britta Waldschmidt Nelson from the German Historical Institute. And my question goes also back to this idea of how can you find a balance between doing what's, in, in Angela Merkel's view, morally the right thing and her desire of keeping the European Union together. Because at least the, the way I felt was when the Grexit was discussed, you know, Greece leaving, a lot of people said in Germany, well, we'd rather see Greece leave than Britain because Britain is getting into a stance now more and more critical, and they're going to have a referendum next year on remaining within the European Union. And a lot of British friends of mine are saying, well, the more costs it will be, and you know, the Greek crisis was more costs on the rest of the EU, the more critical that gets. And now we have the refugee crisis, and one of the most outspoken opponents of Merkel on the European front has been David Cameron, blaming Angela Merkel, not only criticizing her stance in being so open, but actually coming out, and British politicians have been blaming her for encouraging refugees to come to Europe. Basically, it's her fault, and therefore Germany should deal with it alone. And how do you think that Merkel can find a way to balance this, to somehow get Britain onto track in helping out, because in the long run, I think, and that's why so many Germans are so frustrated with the situation, it's not that they feel we can't let people in, but they feel frustrated that outside of the Scandinavian countries, nobody else in Europe seems to be willing to pull the weight. Some of the Eastern Europeans can't for economic reasons, but other countries such as Britain simply say no, and if you push us on the issue, we will leave the EU. Okay, we're coming to the end. So let me, I think there's another question right here. Let's just gather and so that we can have a final round <clears throat> for our panelists. I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I'm, I keep wondering, how do you find jobs for all of these people? And who is it in the German structure that is starting to ask those questions and pull ideas together because all of a sudden having to find jobs for thousands and thousands and thousands of people can be really challenging. Okay, so a few questions. You know, the one thing that's interesting just to compare is that uh, during the Balkan uh, crises, uh, uh, I think Germany took, it took in over a million uh, Bosnians, Kosovars, and others uh, not too long ago, uh, many of them Muslim. Um, most of them did not go home. They are integrated into German society. So it's not as if, well, this is a huge outflow since World War II for Europe. We have not, it, this is not suddenly something completely new. It has happened before. And other countries have taken in their share. I just wonder if there's any differences now uh, because of that. The other thing, just to mention, of course, somebody mentioned Scandinavia. I mean, the Swedes, I think, per capita are taking in more uh, refugees than the Germans, smaller country. So it's not as if Germany is only doing this. But clearly the refugee crisis, as Karen said earlier, because it goes into neighborhoods and schools and communities, it's simply a different type of challenge than a, a traditional foreign policy challenge. And I think she's being tested. So let's go just last uh, point for everybody, if you could keep it brief so we can keep our audience on time. Holger? Yeah, I would say <coughs> the challenge of integrating the refugees is probably uh, one of the biggest challenges ever. And, and uh, on one hand, Germany could try to use it. Um, German's population is decreasing, um, as, as many Western industrial societies are. So on, on one hand, it could be a, a great advantage to find the right people for the right kind of jobs. On the other hand, it's a great challenge if you fail with doing that, you have hundreds of thousands of young, young male men um, sitting in, in uh, asylum houses uh, without any kind of jobs, any kind of perspective. I mean, wh what are they going to do? They are probably establishing a parallel society. Uh, they are looking for ways of, of gaining money uh, without uh, uh, going to work somewhere. 
So you better invest in that field. Um, it, will be, it will be very important for the political outcome, and it might be dynamite if you fail on that. So I would say that's not only for, for the policy, politics a huge challenge, but also for the, for the economy, for all those companies and businesses. So we, we better are prepared um, to, to invest a lot of time in, in that field. Alan? Um, well, certainly what Germany is doing at the moment is um, uh, that um, the government appointed the head of the labour agency to also uh, run the programme to try and integrate uh, refugees into the workforce. So they're actually, um, as far as I understand, the, the, the wheels are in motion and it being Germany, it will probably be relatively efficient. Um, <laughs> As for Britain, Britain, I think that the uh, the, the debate in the UK, I wouldn't um, I, I I wouldn't mix these debates. That uh, it's not Cameron who's criticised Merkel. He's been very careful not to do that. But uh, of course, other UK politicians have, because the whole issue of, of Europe uh, in the United Kingdom is toxic, and um, I think it's it's difficult but possible to parse what the language is and what the actual meaning is. And I think that uh, in Germany, Merkel and others, they are exasperated by the kind of rhetoric in the United Kingdom, but I think they know to strip off some of the more abrasive tone uh, to get to the nub of the matter of what does David Cameron want to allow him to present it as a victory to keep the United Kingdom in the EU. Karen? So on, on the question about can we find jobs for all these people, demography is destiny. And so you do have this other side of the migration and refugee crisis with Germans saying we actually need this migrant population. And then the challenge is how do you integrate them? And there's a language issue, there's also an employment issue. But just to pick on a point Alan mentioned is you've had some key German business leaders stand up and say this is good for Germany. And one of them is Dieter Zetsche, the CEO of Daimler, who's created special trainee positions there for some of the refugees. So I think the real question will be can Germans successfully integrate this population? But they do need that population. And then on, on Britain and the EU, one piece of this will be the package that the EU can put together in response to the letter that Cameron finally penned with his demands. And I think there is trade space there. And I think there is the opportunity to put on offer reforms that Cameron can then sell to his constituency. But the other point is, when you think about these crises, Eurozone, Russia, migration, all of those touch on incredibly sensitive issues in an EU context. And when we think about European integration, the two most successful areas of integration had been money and borders, had been creation of the euro, member states giving up sovereignty over their currency to create a single European currency, members giving up sovereignty over their national borders to create the Schengen area. You do have a consensus that was built around Eurozone policy. It was really messy and it was hard and there was a lot of anger and resentment, but you got to yes. The same way on Russia, you got to yes, and this is the challenge now for Europe. Can they build a workable consensus among the 28 EU member states? And I will suggest that I'm mildly optimistic about this because I don't see a national solution to this problem. I don't see how you deal with a refugee and migration crisis more effectively by retreating to national policies. And so I think that the member states can see the added value of a European policy. But that is the test. And if they can do that, it could actually be a net positive in that UK debate. But the jury's still out. Thank you. So we've been conducting a power profile of German Chancellor Angela Merkel, which uh, if I thought of my German friends, a Mach's profile of the <laughs> Chancellor that would stun them that we would even do some, such a thing. <coughs> so it's a very American sort of thing to do, but in that uh, spirit, uh, good faith, Holger Stark, Alan Crawford, Karen Donfrey, thanks to you for joining us. Thank you to the audience. <laughs>